Uh, my the rest of the panel that I have put together for today is for today is in North America. So I'm going to bring them in uh, virtually. <clears throat> so I'm just going to uh, say a few words and kind of put the context for the Islandora project, which is part of some of the the work that's being done on these digital humanities projects. And then I'm going to let uh, three of uh, my colleagues speak to it, and I'll introduce each of them as, uh, as the time comes up. So of course, we all need a cute title uh, for the talks. Uh, and collaboratory has been used in a lot of different ways. So uh, collaboratorium digitus humanitas <coughs> is uh, the description of what I'm using to describe this which is a desire to create a common framework and or a set of interoperable tools to provide a digital humanities scholars workbench. So in my limited experience in kind of the digital uh, humanities community, we often see a lot of very creative uh, projects, tools uh, developed uh, that typically have soft funding. Uh, they represent the, the vision of the, the uh, faculty member who works on the project uh, and then they, the soft funding runs out and there's no kind of sustainable approach. Um, so what we were hoping to do was take a lot of these sometimes soft, fun, uh, soft funded projects and integrate them into a, large fr a larger framework which may have a more sustainable uh, approach about it. And the goal again is to support a wide range of digital humanities requirements. Uh, for a couple of the projects, the framework that we're using is Islandora, so it provides us with the Fedora underpinnings, uh, which provide us that good long-term uh, preservation uh, framework, and also a lot of the the uh, cutting-edge type functionality that we want in terms of semantic uh, relationships, uh, the ability to store any kind of metadata, all the kinds of things that come from that Fedora repo. And then the Drupal front end of Islandora gives us a great deal of flexibility in how we integrate in uh, different projects. And you'll see a, an example of that uh, with uh, the integration of Susan Brown's QuirkWriter project. And Susan's going to speak about her project. And you'll see that integrated into a larger Islandora framework. The ultimate goal of those specific e efforts is to release what we in the Islandora community call Solution Pack. So our goal later this year is to release a digital humanities solution pack, which will have these various tools uh, integrated in to a standard framework which can accommodate the various types of uh, content that would typically be uh, of interest to a digital humanities uh, <coughs> scholarly context. So images, video, paged images or books, uh, TEI, all of the kinds of things that you would uh, normally consider. Now, I've never done this before, so I'm going to see if, oops. Before I make the first introduction, I'll show a picture. So the person on your left is Dean Irvine, who's going to go first. And uh, I will, we were going to use video at first, but I thought it might be uh, interfere with the, the audio. <coughs> So Dean is a um, Canadian Studies Bicentennial Visiting Professor for 2011-12 at Yale. Uh, he's also an Associate Professor in the Department of English at Dalhousie University in, in Canada and Director of the Editing Modernism in Canada Project, uh, EMIC. And EMIC is a project to facilitate collaboration among researchers and institutions from regions all across Canada, from the US, Europe, and New Zealand to produce new print and digital editions of Canadian modernist texts. So um, as a good example of collaboration, I'm going to share my screen with Dean so he can see the slides that may not be in the proper sequence uh, of what he's going to speak to. So Dean, if you, uh, you're on audio now, so if you need me to move ahead on a slide, let me know. So I'm going to let you start while I share my screen with you if you want to 
if you want to go ahead and start, Dean, the first slide is just the, the home page of the Modernist Commons. Okay, thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Am I coming through? Yep. Are you hearing me, Mark? Yes, we are. Oh. Okay, great. Um, I'm not actually seeing your screen shared with me, so... Yeah, oh, there we go. That's... Take me a sec here. I just got a... Too many windows. Indeed. See it now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so Mark is uh, showing for you uh, the homepage for the Modernist Commons. Um, broadly conceived, uh, Modernist Commons is something of an ancillary site, um, modernistcommons.ca, um, related to uh, the larger project that Mark just gave you a, a great overview of, which is editing modernism in Canada. Um, we've, we came up with the idea of keeping the two sites separate um, for a number of reasons, um, one of which was the was something that Mark has alluded to, which is concern about uh, long-term preservation of the digital materials that are being stored in the commons and not necessarily having those pinned to a particular um, a pin to a particular research project, even though it gives it gives rise to it in the initial instance. So. What we have here is both the repository and a suite of editing tools. And if, once you go into the Commons, you'll find um, you'll find a number of collections. These are all um, test collections in one one manner or another. Um, some of which have been produced um, as part of workshops that uh, we've been running over the past year, testing out the tools with real live users and others, um, some sample materials, such as what you're seeing here, um, which was digitized by um, EMIC postdoctoral fellow Matt Huckalak, uh, which is a complete run of a bilingual um, little magazine that was produced in Montreal in 1919 called Le Nigog. What your initial view of Le Nigog is uh, to take a look at it in the context of an embedded Internet Archive uh, book viewer. So you can, this is simply uh, the book object itself, or in this case the magazine object. Um, we can talk about the, book, the booking of everything. Um, the, it, it so that you can simply just leap through and read it without any kind of markup. There are, however, other views. Oh, um, here, what you have here is um, is a screen that gives you a view of all the different ways in which you can organize and orchestrate the um, book object within uh, the, the given collection. You can either use the Internet Archive viewer or you can use a different viewer which allows um, for different kinds of views, which uh, is particularly important because the Internet Archive viewer um, uh, frames everything according to the second to last image in the sequence, and therefore if you have odd-sized images, you may want to choose a different viewer. Uh, what we have here is, uh, uh, is an example of the editing interface as it exists at the present time. In the left-hand pane, you, you can see that you have a choice of different kinds of markup that you may want to look at, whether you want to look at entities, I'll leave that to, for Susan to discuss in more, more detail, whether you want to look at the, the structure, in this case, the TEI markup, whether you want to look at RDF relations, once again, I'll leave that for Susan to discuss, or whether you want to look at image annotations, which is um, what you're seeing up here. Uh, the, middles, the middle pane is uh, the Modernist Commons integration of the Quirk Writer, which is an XML editor that'll, uh, that allows us to do um, both TEI and RDF markup. And on the right-hand pane, you'll see at the bottom, powered by Shared Canvas. What we've integrated here is the Shared, uh, shared Canvas annotation tool, um, which is being developed out of Stanford in concert with uh, a suite of other RDF um, 
markup tools um, undertaken by the Open Annotation Collaboration Group. So what we can what we can see here. Oh, now we're moving on to something else. Sorry, do you want me to go <laughs> back, Dean? No, 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 it's fine. Um, I mean, the, the annotation is done with shared canvas. I was simply, I was just going to add that. Um, what we have here is um, a shot of the um, entities uh, that have been created um, for um, markup in using the Quirk Writer tool. So at present, um, what we have is that if you're going along and annotating um, using the middle screen, um, you'll come across, you want to create um, an authority record for a person. Um, we can create the new authority record. Um, and this is where the collective um, intelligence of all the editors as part of the group uh, is deposited. So these are the authority records that then can subsequently be added to other book objects. Here we have, we're ingesting. Uh, Sorry, no, but, adding yeah. authorities. This is adding, uh, adding authority to another collection. And that's, so, that, that's the last surprise slide. That's the last surprise slide or the last slide period? Both. Okay, nice. So this is adding, uh, this is what comes up when you um, go to add an authority. You then um, uh, choose which collection that you want to add that authority to. Um, and bada bing, bada boom, you can do it that way. So the, the authorities that we just shown were um, simply persons. We can also add um, places, events, um, organizations as um, as um, entities as well to be marked up using uh, the Quirk Writer. Uh, did you have anything else, Dean, beyond that last slide, or? Um, I, I I won't. Uh, uh, maybe we'll come back in to have it. You know, to be able to talk later. I, I don't want to take up too much time. I want to leave more time for other people to talk. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Susan Brown, uh, who did her doctorate on Victoria's feminist literary theory at the University of Alberta. Uh, shortly after that, she co-founded the Orlando Project, which was a born digital text base on women's writing, and one of the first large-scale humanities computing projects uh, in Canada with over 100 contributors. Orlando published online with Cambridge University Press in 2006 uh, and continues to experiment and grow. Uh, she became increasingly hooked on what is now called the digital humanities and her current research touches on collaborative systems, interface design and usability, and visualization and data mining. Uh, so I'll let you go ahead, Susan. Okay, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Or can you hear me in Scotland, I guess I should say? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so thanks, Mark, for uh, organizing the panel and apologies for not being able to attend in person. Um, I'm going to speak in somewhat more general terms for the most part than, than Dean did in hopes of um, sort of picking up on some of the things that you mentioned in your introduction, Mark. Uh, the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory is an infrastructure project that's setting up a virtual research environment for the study of writing in and about Canada. And if you can advance to the next slide, Mark, that will just give a kind of very basic overview of its scope. Leah Vanderyat, who I think might be there in the audience now, is going to be talking about the aims and the system components of Quirk in more detail in the Pecha Kucha session R5, RF5 on communities and collaborations, which I think is right on the heels of this one. So I, I didn't want to um, overlap too much with that. Uh, what I want to talk about is the concept of a uh, sort of collaborative DH framework. Quirk is a really ambitious project for the, the budget that it has, and that ambition is possible only thanks to the collaborative nature of the digital humanities and the digital libraries tool building communities. It's only because things like Fedora um, and Islandora exist, it's only because initiatives like um, uh, archive.org are sharing their, their tools that we can aim as big as we can and what we achieve I think is going to be far more useful than it would be otherwise. What I want to focus on here for the couple of minutes that I have is to um, talk about a couple of things that I think define a DH collaboratory which I think 
needs to build on the repository model, but also to depart from the um, dominant institutional repository model, as I understand it, to operate in uh, many libraries. So to invoke the perspective of uh, one of our librarian collaborators on Quirk, I want to address what makes us seem so weird, I think, to so at least some people in the library community. Um, what many digital humanities projects need, and I think this is very clear from Dean's um, demo of the modernist commons, is not just a place for depositing finished and published research um, and building preservation into DH repositories is really crucial, but also a place for doing that research, for amassing materials, if you can advance to the next slide, uh, Mark, for amassing materials, sorting through them, organizing them, analyzing them, annotating them, producing new materials from scratch or as mashups of earlier materials, editing and revising them, often, often doing that in collaboration with others, publishing various of these items at various stages of this process, keeping them up to date, fixing errors, enhancing them, and so on as new knowledge emerges. In other words, it's a very, we need very dynamic environments that are very permeable and that can support this kind of ongoing evolution of uh, scholarly research in a digital environment. Most of that kind of work is happening on personal computers now and is a very bad model because it means a lot of stuff is lost, it means that interoperability opportunities are lost, and um, so what we need to do is to shift uh, to uh, kind of online infrastructure that supports these activities and manages them in a more uh, scalable, sustainable, and interoperable way. And that's going to take a village made up of lots of scholars, postdocs, librarians, research assistants, programmers, metadata experts, systems administrators, project managers, and so on. And I think Mark's pointed to a, a major challenge associated with DH projects when he talks about the fact that the funding is almost always soft. Um, so a DH repository environment needs to provide an infrastructure that makes it as easy as possible to manage these sorts of diverse roles and activities across diverse projects that are at different points in funding cycles and some of them will be unfunded and only have a few dedicated researchers um, working on them in you know uneven uh, spurts and so on. And in many cases DH projects are not going to be able to afford a large team with expertise in all of the areas that they might need so the repository structure can't assume that, uh, for instance, metadata and curation activities uh, in any given project are going to be carried out by professionals, so it needs to provide support for that. So if we can advance to the next slide, Mark. Um, this is why one of Quirk's major development initiatives is the Quirk Writer, which you've just seen embedded in the Modernist Commons framework. And this is an editor that will allow scholars to apply or edit TEI or other XML documents. Um, and I'll just, I wasn't going to talk about it in great deal, but I'll elaborate on it slightly since, since Dean suggested that that might be of interest. Um, what you're seeing here now is, uh, um, so one of the three panes that you saw, or no, two of the three panes that you saw in, in the Modernist Commons image of the, of the editing environment. On the left, you see a structure panel that's showing you um, the TEI markup of the document on the right, and you'll see that there are three um, of those panels that can be activated on the left-hand side. The structure one is the one that you see. There's also one for entities that allows for um, the application of um, entity tags using RDF uh, open annotation um, markup. And then there's a relations panel which allows you to actually construct triples using those entities from within the editor. Uh, as Dean indicated, one of the major ways in which the editor is trying to promote interoperability is through the use of, of common entity or authority uh, collections. And so what you can do is uh, pull up a hierarchical set of choices of entities starting with those associated with the, the project nearest to your document but then moving out into the world of linked data so that we um, try to get a, a higher level of interoperability than if the, the projects that are working from within Quirkwriter are siloed from the outset. 
So integrating authority lookup becomes one of the means of really trying to get a level of consistency across the projects, obviously by incorporating TEI markup and, and uh, RDF, we're trying to promote um, better forms of metadata than a lot of um, projects that might otherwise just look at publishing in, in, you know, working in Word and then publishing in HTML or something like that uh, would otherwise produce. So this editor is, it's written in JavaScript, it's completely browser resident, and so it eliminates the need for software purchase and installation on the part of individual scholars. Um, and it, I think incorporating a tool like this into an online repository environment raises major questions when it comes to things like versioning and archiving, which could potentially be triggered by each new keystroke that changes the document. And so I'd say that one of the major challenges in the ongoing adaptation of repository models and repository systems to meet the needs of di the digital humanities is going to have to do with the extent to which we can produce dynamic resource development environments rather than ones where objects simply repose. And as Mark was saying, leverage the incredible power of systems like Fedora to, to meet those challenges. And if we can do that, then what we'll get is broader scholarly participation in the production of digital resources, a higher um, quality of digital resource uh, overall, and we'll be able to make the scholarly community active and valuable partners in the maintenance and curation of digital content. Now there's a whole lot that, that goes with that that I'm not going to get into now. Um, what I just want to talk to you briefly before wrapping up is that I think the converse challenge for digital humanities scholars will be to work within more generalized environments that aren't customized to the need of a single project in order that their work won't end up in silos in the end. So silos are good in lots of ways. They protect their contents from spoilage and depredation. They've got a kind of bad rap in the um, uh, sort of online community at the moment, but I think silos actually are good. But they're they're also you know rigid and impermeable in ways that impede oper interoperability, which is why they become a metaphor for some of the problems with the online environments that we work with. So what we need to do is to take something that takes the solid and stable infrastructure represented by the silo and merges it with the idea of shared public resources or commons. And here's an image of the kind of infrastructure that I want the Collaboratorium Digitus Humanitas to become. It's a design for renovating a pair of silos in Amsterdam into multi-purpose facilities that would house offices, restaurants, a commercial space, a theater, and also a climbing gym. So it's a design that's to allow allow people to scale literally inside and outside the infrastructure. And I think what's so evocative here is that the silo is porous, it has bridges and portals for communication between inside and outside, it supports a range of activities, movement in and out on a couple of levels, and unanticipated user-generated pathways for the more adventurous. And one of the silos has actually gone from uniform and rigid to charmingly curvy and squashy. So. <laughs> This is the kind of thing that I hope we are collaboratively working towards. Thanks very much. I have a thanks uh, screen. If you can just move to the last slide, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're running up against the edge of the clock here. The final speaker is Doug Reside, who became the first digital curator of performing arts at New York Public Library in February last year after serving for four and a half years on the directorial staff at the Myth Project at the University of Maryland College Park. And he's led numerous digital humanities projects and is currently editing the Musical of the Month blog at NYPL, uh, which makes available one musical theater libretto each month. Um, so Doug, did you want to... Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, talk very quickly. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I have a, uh, this will be just kind of random things that we're doing at NYPL right now um, in five minutes or less. The, um, the main thing is we're in the process of completely reconfiguring our repository uh, to, um, for, to use a, a kind of uh, adaptation, I guess, of uh, Fedora, but also to take in a lot of video and audio content and potentially a large born digital collections in the next a uh, couple of years. We've just engaged um, a vendor named um, Brightcove that uses that is used by several, um, I guess, online streaming uh, 
media companies to provide secure access to uh, our digitized video and audio collections um, wherever we can provide access to them. So uh, that in some cases is only one room in the Performing Arts Library. In other cases, it's anywhere in the um, in the system, and in other cases, it's the entire um, the entire world. So we we've got that sort of underway. Actually, we're in the process of trying to hire a developer to work on the front end search interface for that. So if there's anyone in the audience that is interested in coming to New York for a year or so to work with us on that, I would love to talk to you later. Um, we are also working on ways of displaying documents. Our current display interface is primarily the digital gallery, which um, I think uh, many of you have probably seen, but it's, it's really focused on displaying images and was originally created with at least a primary goal of uh, kind of sustaining itself by selling uh, prints of uh, images for which we had obtained the copyright. We're moving to a model where the digital gallery uh, is also, a, is continues to be a way of uh, viewing our, our photograph and print collections, but also is a way of displaying our archival material. Uh, last September, we organized a meeting of, or a, really a code sprint, a week-long code sprint of a lot of digital humanities developers to come to work to extend the Internet Archive book reader that it sounded like uh, Dean might have shown in his presentation. Um, we've since uh, decided that we're, we're going to move away from the Internet Archive book reader and instead use the uh, New York Times um, funded, really, or at least uh, they're, they're some way involved with the um, the Document Cloud project, which I think is also associated with the journalism school in the, in, um, in Kansas. Uh, Dean, if you've got a, um, uh, if you can look at the, the chat uh, section there, the last link there, directme.nypl.org, do you see that? Uh, yeah, just a sec. And I think we're actually running out of time. OK, so uh, if you can just uh, click that link, I'll just briefly explain it and then be done. You see it? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so this is a scan of a bunch of our uh, city directories. We're using this um, uh, New York Times document viewer, which also allows for annotation and links to OCR in the background. We found that the code is a little bit better documented and seems to be more actively under development than the Internet Archives book reader at present. Um, that's all. Thanks. All right, thanks, Doug. Oh, yeah, I think you heard the claps, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, are we done, or do time for a question, or? Uh, one quick question. And Any questions? Hi, uh, Christopher Yoakum, Adina. I was um, kind of interested in the quirk writer, and you said every time uh, someone taps on the keys and write something in, you want to record that change. Have you looked into using SVN or Git or any of the software development tools that repositories that do this kind of stuff uh, specifically? Because it's done a lot of work for these to make these work for code, which are just text, and you can sort of underpin them um, into these kinds of, of systems. Have you, have you thought about that? Uh, uh, Yes, I think I, you were breaking up a bit, so I don't think I heard the, the question fully, but I think I heard enough of it to respond. So yeah, versioning, software versioning systems are obviously, I think, the, the direction to look if one wanted to do a um, you know, really granular versioning. I, I think um, what I was pointing to was the question of how one wants if, if one is looking to develop a generalized infrastructure, where does one put the effort? Does one, there are a number of projects that I think are really interested in that kind of, and, and it would obviously be fascinating to track online document production with that degree of granularity, but do you put your development money in that direction, or do you try and figure out where the sweet spot is across a wide range of projects and figure out exactly how you want your versioning to work in order to meet the needs of the greatest number of projects, but yes, I mean, I think that um, that is where on the sort of research, the, the research wing of, of Quark as opposed to the infrastructure development wing, um, we would definitely look in that direction in terms of thinking about how to handle the, um, the challenges of versioning that are
are introduced once you move to this kind of um, dynamic online uh, production environment. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Susan and, and Dean and Doug for taking the time back, uh, back home to come in uh, virtually. And uh, also, if you're interested in seeing what uh, the Quirk Writer or the uh, Editing Modern, uh, the EMIC project uh, uh, interfaces look like, then you can uh, come by the booth downstairs and we can show you uh, how they work. Thanks. Thank you.